stars are right, and that means it's time for another episode of The Whisper in Darkness. I am your host, The Man from Lang. Thank you very much for joining me today. On this episode, I am reviewing the Rogue Cards in A Thousand Shapes of Horror, the second Mythos pack in the Dream Eater cycle. There are spoilers throughout if you care about that sort of thing. If you enjoy what you hear, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Before we get started, I'd like to thank the patrons of this channel for their tremendous support and Cole Monroe Chitty for his fantastic depiction of a man from Lang that graces the splash screen. The Arkham Horror LCG community is amazing and these people have gone above and beyond to bring you the content like these reviews. If you'd like to become a patron to support the channel's goals and see your name in lights, follow the link down below, sign up for a tier of your choice and claim your rewards. That would be awesome. Without further ado, let's get started. The first rogue card in the box is Let God Sort Them Out. It's a free rogue event with a combat skill icon and the tactic and faded traits. It has the game text, play only during one of your turns in which you defeated enemies with a total of six or more health. Add Let God Sort Them Out to the victory display and immediately end your turn. When earning experience during the resolution of this scenario, you earn one additional experience. Let God Sort Them Out was among the four cards spoiled in the preview article for A Thousand Shapes of Horror, so much of what I have to say here may sound familiar. It would appear designer Matt Newman learned from the mistake he made when he designed Delve Too Deep, the mystic event released in the game's first Mythos pack, the Miskatonic Museum. When Delve Too Deep was released, it seemed like a various dubious bargain to many players, me included. Bad things happen when players draw encounter cards, so players equated drawing an additional encounter card in exchange for an experience point to uh, playing with fire. If I'm playing solo, I'm still reluctant to play Delve Too Deep unless I'm certain I can deal with the uh, consequences of drawing that extra encounter card. I'd much rather take the mental trauma from arcane research from Threads of Fate and be done with it. However, it uh, didn't take long for the community to find a loophole if you play Delve Too Deep in multiplayer. Delve Too Deep requires each player to draw an encounter card, unless, of course, three of the four players have already resigned, in which case those players still get the victory point, even though they've risked nothing. That may not seem too bad at first, but it quickly becomes abusive during a campaign when you've got multiple mystics or off-class mystics playing multiple copies of Delve Too Deep after most players have resigned. I've done it myself, and it's great fun, but it's certainly not in keeping with the spirit of the card. Let God Sort Them Out puts the kibosh on those sorts of antics right out of the gate. The card grants only one additional experience point and only to the rogue or off-class rogue who played the card. The rest of the investigators at the table, well, they get nothing. Let God Sort Them Out also nips other potentially abusive strategies in the bud. As an additional cost to play the card, you must immediately end your turn, which uh, prevents you from playing that second copy of Let God Sort Them Out in your hand. Let God Sort Them Out is also more difficult to trigger than Delve Too Deep. First, there must be enemies with a total of six or more health in play at the same time. Then you've got to defeat those enemies in one turn. Honestly, uh, I can't think of the last time I defeated enemies with a total of six or more health in one turn while playing solo. You might be able to do it if you kill a boss towards the end of a scenario. Unfortunately, killing a boss, such as the uh, Experiment or Silas Bishop, usually triggers the objective that ends the scenario. And if the scenario ends immediately after the boss dies, you won't have a chance to play Let God Sort Them Out. Let God Sort Them Out seems easier to trigger in multiplayer, since enemies are more prevalent in that format. Then you realize that you've got to take an action to play Let God Sort Them Out after you've defeated those enemies, since the card isn't fast. Unless you're playing Tony Morgan or another rogue who can generate additional actions, you've got only two actions to defeat those enemies. That seems highly unlikely, unless, of course, your fellow investigators soften them up a little for you, or you're packing some serious heat, such as the Chicago Typewriter from Lost in Time and Space, or the rogue version of the 45 Thompson III for, from For the Greater Good. An investigator may have the actions and weaponry required to trigger Let God Sort Them Out, but the Chaos Bag can still disrupt your best laid plans, especially if you need to kill multiple enemies to trigger it. Imagine defeating a 3 uh, health enemy and then pulling a tentacle, botching the second kill. Suddenly you're not going to kill 6 health worth of enemies this turn, and if you want to do it next turn, you've got to find yourself another enemy to reach that threshold. Let God Sort Them Out may be easier to trigger if you're playing certain scenarios in the Dream Eater cycle, which feature enemies with the Swarm keyword. One swarm of spiders doesn't have enough health, but uh, two certainly would uh, do the trick. 
If you're playing the uh, Dark Side of the Moon scenario and your alarm level jumps, killing a bunch of cats from Saturn would probably let you trigger Let God Sort Them Out too. That said, the Dream Eater cycle seems to dish out experience points like uh, candy on Halloween, so putting in a lot of extra effort to earn one additional XP for one investigator doesn't seem that worthwhile. The odd thing about Let God Sort Them Out is that it seems like a way better way to generate bonus experience points after you've already spent a significant, significant number of experience points on high-powered weaponry or cards that generate additional actions. That uh, begs the question, if you've already earned enough experience to upgrade your deck so that you can mow down enemies like with relative ease, why bother with Let God Sort Them Out? Don't get me wrong, I like earning bonus experience points, but uh, I would prefer to earn that experience before I evolve into a lean, mean killing machine, not after. One of the problems that I run into while playing the Arkham Horror LCG is that experience points can be harder to come by in solo than multiplayer. That's not surprising, considering a group of four investigators can cover more ground and kill more enemies than a solo player can in the same amount of time. I'd like a card that addresses that disparity, but uh, Let God Sort Them Out is not that card. At this point, it seems like a little bit of a win more card for multiplayer decks. Let God Sort Them Out is a level 0 card, so there are many, many investigators who can play it. Realistically, I think there are only two who will seriously consider it. Tony Morgan and Mark Harrigan have the combat skill and the weaponry required to take out enemies efficiently. Tony has an advantage over Mark, though, due to his uh, built-in action advantage, as well as access to a bunch of other rogue cards that can generate additional actions. Cards that uh, generate bonus experience points tend to see a lot of play. It's uh, worth noting, however, that uh, most of the popular Tony Morgan builds over at Arkham DB don't bother playing this card because the reward simply isn't worth the effort or the card slot. Delve Too Deep is popular because it's easy to trigger and every investigator at the table benefits in the end. Let God Sort Them Out makes a rogue or off-class rogue work really hard for that bonus experience point, and then only one investigator reaps the rewards. Let God Sort Them Out doesn't seem playable in solo, since the odds of taking out six health worth of enemies in one turn is quite low. Killing six health worth of enemies is more realistic in multiplayer, but investigators tend to earn more experience points in that format anyway, so you've got to ask yourself, is Let God Sort Them Out worth the card slot? Unfortunately for uh, Let God Sort Them Out, I think the answer for most players will be a resounding no. The second rogue card in the pack is Swift Reload. It's a three cost event that costs two experience points. It has an agility skill icon and the tactic and trick traits. It's fast and you may play it only during your turn. It has the following game text. Choose a firearm asset you control with fewer ammo tokens than its use's X value. Place ammo on that asset until it has ammo equal to its use's X value. If you're playing a rogue or off-class rogue who needs to add ammo tokens to firearms, you don't have that many options. All rogues can play Contraband from the Miskatonic Museum or Contraband 2 from the uh, Return to the Dunwich Legacy expansion. Skids O'Toole, Tony Morgan, and Leo Anderson also have the option of dipping into the Guardian class for extra ammunition from the Corset or Venturer from the Forgotten Age. I've never been a fan of Contraband. It costs you four resources and an action to play, and there's an opportunity cost. Sure, it will double the number of ammo tokens on an asset, but uh, doubling zero or one token for four resources is a very bad deal indeed. Contraband has the illicit trait, so Finn Edwards can search for it with uh, smuggled goods. Unfortunately, the illicit trait also means that Preston Fairmont can't play it. Contraband 2 is an improvement on its level zero counterpart. It's cheaper at three resources and gives you the option of placing two ammo tokens on an asset and drawing a card or doubling the number of ammo tokens. Contraband 2 is also an event with one willpower and two intellect skill icons, which are attractive if you're playing the Crystallizer of Dreams from the Dream Eaters Deluxe Expansion. Swift Reload costs the same number of resources and experience points as Contraband 2, but it has only one agility icon, which uh, makes it less appealing to Crystallizer decks. In exchange, Swift Reload is fast, which saves you not only an action, but also an attack of opportunity if you're out of ammo and an enemy is bearing down on you. Swift Reload's value depends on the size of your firearm's magazine. You're going to get a lot of bang for your buck if you Swift Reload an empty uh, 45 Thompson or Chicago typewriter. Swift Reload is less impressive if you target a uh, 41 caliber Derringer or Lupara. 
You'd get the same number of ammo tokens with Contraband 2 and a card draw to boot. It's worth noting that Swift Reload does not work with Jenny's Twin 45s, since X ammo is zero ammo. Swift Reload swaps the supply and illicit traits for the tactic and trick traits. Despite being a tactic, Mark Harrigan can't play it since it's a level 2 card. However, Swift Reload is an option for Rita Young if she's looking for a way to reload her old hunting rifle. It's the only option for Preston Fairmont too. So which cards should you use to reload your firearms? Well, if you're playing firearms in Preston Fairmont or Rita Young, Swift Reload is the only game in town. If you're playing one of the other rogues or off-class rogues, you've got a choice between Extra Ammunition, Contraband 2, or Swift Reload. I think you've got to give the nod to Swift Reload here. The ability to reload your firearm as a free-triggered ability is awesome. Your gun needs to be empty or nearly so to get the most out of it, but that's unlikely to be a pro problem if you're on uh, enemy sweeping duty. If you're playing the Crystallizer of Dreams, you may want to consider Contraband 2 instead, since it has a much better uh, icon spread. The third rogue card in the pack is Gregory Gree, Muckraker. He's a 3-cost asset with an intellect skill icon and the ally, criminal, and dreamer traits. He enters play with 9 resources stacked on him. When you initiate a skill test, you may spend up to 3 resources from Gregory Gree. If the skill test succeeds by at least that amount, gain that many resources. Gregory Gree has 1 health and 2 sanity. Resources are the lifeblood of rogues, and the class has received plenty of level 0 cards over the years to help them generate piles and piles of them. You can divide those cards into roughly two categories. On the one hand, you've got the cards that will generate resources in exchange for actions, and on the other, you've got the cards that generate resources in response to doing something else. Burglary, Dario Elamine, Decorated Skull, and Investments fall into the first category. Burglary, a rogue asset from the corset, will give you three resources instead of a clue if you succeed on an investigate action. Dario Elamine, a rogue asset from the Unspeakable Oath, will trade you two resources for an action if there are no enemies at your location. Decorated Skull from the Forgotten Age will let you draw a card and generate a resource once you've stacked some charges on it. And Investments, a rogue asset from Union and Disillusion, lets you stockpile up to ten resources on it until you're ready to take an action to move them to your resource pool. Lone Wolf and Watch This fall into the second category. Lone Wolf, a rogue asset from Blood on the Altar, will give you one resource each turn as long as there are no other investigators at your location, while Watch This from the Pallid Mask lets you piggyback resource generation on skill tests. Generally speaking, cards in this category see a lot more play than cards in the former because they're simply more efficient in terms of action economy. That brings us to Gregory Gree, who has more in common with a card like Watch This than a card like Burglary. Much like Watch This, Gregory lets you generate resources while succeeding on actions that you were going to do anyway. Part of Gregory's appeal is that he gives you the option of Drip Economy or Burst Economy, depending on how much risk you're willing to take. If you prefer a Go Slow approach, you can nickel and dime Gregory for a resource every skill test, slowly draining his account over the course of a scenario. If you're desperate for cash and you're confident that you can su succeed by three, you can liberate all nine resources on Gregory in as little as one turn. That uh, sort of flexibility is fantastic. One of the great things about Gregory is that his ability is attached to a warm body with one health and two sanity. Rogues are notoriously weak in the willpower department, so that two sanity will certainly come in handy. Once Gregory has handed over all of his resources, he can step in front of an enemy for you, if you're unwilling to throw Gregory to the wolves, you could play Calling in Favors to swap him for a different ally or replay him to generate even more resources over the course of a scenario. I've had a chance to play with Gregory and the, the ability to generate resources with an ally is great. It's very tempting, especially if you're playing a deck built around the Succeed by 2 mechanic to try to grab resources 2 or 3 at a time. Honestly, I think you're much better off to settle for one, maybe two resources every skill test unless the encounter deck is pressuring you to kill Gregory. The succeed by two mechanic has always felt a little bit fragile to me at level zero, so it's easy to fritter, fritter away Gregory's bounty with a few bad pulls from the chaos bag. The big question is not whether Gregory is a good ally, he is, but uh, whether he's a better ally than some of the other options available at level zero. I like Gregory more than Dario Elamine. Dario's bonuses are great if you can maintain that 10 resource threshold, but he's more expensive than Gregory and his resource generation mechanic feels clunkier than that of the Dreamer. 
Gregory's Cache could help you uh, maintain that 10 resource threshold though, so playing Gregory into Dario with Culling in Favors may be worth exploring. I tested the idea in a Jenny Barnes deck, but uh, I wasn't all that satisfied with the result because you really need to draw them in the correct order for it to work efficient efficiently. Obviously, Charisma would go a long way to smoothing over that relationship. That said, if you're purchasing Charisma, you may want to consider pairing Gregory with uh, Lola Santiago or Delilah O'Rourke. Gregory's uh, cash would go a long way to bankrolling Lola and Delilah as they hunt for clues and assassinate enemies, respectively. Of course, you've also got to consider the original big man on campus, Leo DeLuca. I've been playing Leo a lot lately in my Winifred Habamok deck, and uh, that extra action he generates every turn flat out wins games. If I had to choose between Leo and Gregory, I'd still take Leo most of the time because his extra action can be used for anything, including resource generation. However, there's nothing stopping you from using Adaptable to swap Leo for Gregory if you've got your eyes on either Lola or Delilah once you've gained a few experience points. Gregory Gree is a solid addition to the rogue card pool. Rogues need a lot of resources to function well, and Gregory will net you 6 as long as you're able to keep him alive and you don't get too greedy. You can generate resources with Gregory while performing other actions, which makes him very efficient. If you're planning on purchasing Lola Santiago or Delilah O'Rourke later in a campaign, Gregory can help pay for their special abilities, which can uh, get quite expensive if you're triggering them very often. And once he's done, he'll happily step in front of an attack for you, or discover those rotting remains. That's going to do it for my review of the Rogue cards in A Thousand Shapes of Horror. Let God Sort Them Out is uh, the weakest card in the bunch, and uh, one of my picks for probably one of the worst cards in this pack. I'd uh, only play it in multiplayer, and uh, even then it can be difficult to trigger. It's easier to earn experience in multiplayer than it is in solo, which begs the question why you would bother with this card in the first place. Swift Reload gives rogues another way to reload their firearms. It's fast, which is uh, of course fantastic if you're stuck in the middle of a firefight, and, and the amount of ammo it provides is limited only by the size of the magazine of your gun. It's also a godsend for investigators such as Preston Fairmont and Rita Young, who didn't have a way to reload their firearms before this card came out. As for Gregory Greet, he is solid. He is a solid ally who can bankroll rogue investigators who always need cash. I still like Leo De Luca a lot, but Gregory is a viable alternative, especially if you're planning to pick up charisma and other rogue allies with expensive special abilities down the road. That's going to do it for this review. If you enjoy what you hear, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. If you need to contact me, I can be reached at manfromlang at gmail.com. I am also on Twitter at manfromlang. Until the stars are right, keep your shotgun close and your elder sign closer. Take care out there, and happy investigating.